Welcome to our ordination service 2023 for the Indiana South District. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 5 to 6, for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the faith, face of Christ. Would you stand with us as we are led this afternoon in a song of worship? by the Holy Spirit has appointed ordained ministers in the church, grant to us your assistance in this service, given to the ordination of such ministers, and mercifully behold these your servants, now called to this office, and replenish them so with the truth of your doctrine, and adorn them with innocence of life that both by word and good example, they may faithfully serve you in this office to the glory of your name 
and the edification of your church through the merits of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, world without end. Amen. So this is a special day for me. I think it's been about 25 years since I've seen our general officer and guest speaker today. And I was a very, very young minister in the 80s at the time. And uh, Dr. Holdren um, has done an amazing things in the Wesleyan Church. General superintendent, uh, ran our department of curriculum and leadership uh, back in the late 80s and has just been a, a force for us. I couldn't be more happy, more proud to have him today. And if I remember correctly, he was the first general superintendent elected right from the pastoral status as a pastor of a church right into the general officer, which is an amazing accomplishment. So without further ado, Dr. David Holdren. Thank you, Pastor Dan. And uh, I, I could tell that even the town's excited about this event because as we come pulling into town, there was this little digital thing on the right-hand side flashing these bright red numbers at us. Obviously, just w glad we're here, you know? So we're, we're very thankful you finally got it, didn't you? We're thankful to be here, glad for this occasion. Actually, this is a most significant Christian church personal event, especially for three and their spouses, for Andy and for Dennis and for Jeff, because they have a sustained sense that God has called them, has invited them, has compelled them to lead in his church. Today we launch an anointing process that we trust will continue on throughout the course of time, circumstances, and years that will end up being a blessing in your ministry and to the people to whom you minister. We approach uh, this all with a question today. I want, to, I, want to, I want to have this message be dominantly a question. The question is actually posed to us by the Apostle Paul himself as he brings to us some amazing words in 2 Corinthians as a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 3, 4, and 5 are all marvelous chapters about life in Christ and ministry for Christ. And so we begin by reading from chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, verses 14 through 17. Thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? That's the question. Who is equal? Who is equal to this task? Who is equal in light of what? Well, first of all, in light of what the Apostle Paul says about his own challenges. We go back to chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Uh, we see in 2 Corinthians these words to us. He says, um, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We went to tremendous pressure, far beyond our capacity to endure, so that we even despaired of life. In our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. That's a part of his story. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and following talks about the times he was beaten with rods, left for dead, isolated, shipwrecked, time and time again, suffering for what he was doing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul reads this amazing list of challenges and complications and obstacles that tried to prevent him from doing his work in Christ. Consider the range of uh, obstacles any leader, any Christian leader, any pastoral leader can face. Think about them. We were talking about some of these on the way here today. The expectations, the resistance at times, the temptations we can face, the personal and family pressures involved in all this. We find out that if we do a little study of it, uh, upwards of 40 to 50 percent of people who enter the ministry leave it within the first five years. The reasons given tend to be ones like this, stress, a sense of isolation, COVID didn't help that at all. Politics, a sense of division among ourselves over political issues and with other people. 
the effect it has on family, times of conflict. These are some of the reasons why people don't make it past year five. Unfinished, overwhelming task, re the relentlessness of producing the world's best sermon every Sunday. I remember a time in my ministry, I was younger, fortunately, where I was doing two sermons on Sunday, one Sunday school class on Sunday morning, a Bible study Wednesday night, and five 60-second radio spots a week. How do you survive that stuff? I felt like I wouldn't at times. So the relentlessness of producing all this great stuff every seven days, exhaustion, confrontation, seeming rejections, changes in ministry and culture. How do you adjust to the nonstop change in the system of things? I have a list, a written list, that the, that the first time I, I, I did it, 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 it had 67 things that have changed in ministry, culture, or the church since I started ministry in 1971. That list is over 100 changes. How do you adjust to change? We talk about the gospel not changing, and yet we find ourselves needing to adjust and change to the things around us. That sometimes can be difficult and confusing and stressful. Changes. They're the stories of those of us in this room today. We could have an amazing afternoon just sharing the journey that we've taken, including my own. We could be talking about the things we've experienced, the occasional withering sense of inadequacy in this work that comes at times. The, the occasional, the, 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 how close some of us come to folding up our tents and just packing it up and saying, I don't need this, as some have done. So what is implied in the answer to the question, who is equal? The implied answer is nobody. Absolutely nobody is the implied answer to the question. Now, pastors, stay in your seats. Don't get up and run out the building today because the message gets better as we go along here. Uh, let's see if we can find a positive side of this because even the Apostle Paul helps with, it, with this and does not leave us in despair. He says in chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 of 2 Corinthians, listen to these words. This is a little bit better. He says, um, indeed, in our hearts we felt the sins of death. However, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. So maybe he can raise us. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on behalf of our gracious favor that God has granted to us in these ministries. We keep reading this text, and the text uses words like anointing, results, boldness, confidence, competence. So let's find out what some of the good news of this work is all about. Let's look at the brighter side by finishing the question. The question is, who is equal? The answer to that is nobody. The rest of the question is, to such a task. Now it gets better. Who is equal humanly, physically, all the time? Nobody. To such a task. What's the task? Therefore, the, the, the task we'll get to in a second, but let me, let, me, let me say this. Here are four words I want to give you, four words that form the pillars of a bridge that takes us to effective faithfulness in ministry. Catch the four words. These are the same four words that will help any of us live a healthy, productive Christian life. These words, in a sense, are for all of us, not just for three, but listen carefully as we talk about these. The first word is calling. This life we're in to deliver appropriately on behalf of God and others, this life is launched with a sense of calling. Calling is something we talk about as something we get from God. God is calling us, inviting us, compelling us. And we must have a sense of calling in this word if we're going to minister effectively and survive the challenges that it can provide. Calling is so deeply important time and time again. I would come back to the sense that God actually invited me to this amazing ministry. That calling can sustain us. That calling will compel us. That calling will give us the kind of strength that maybe nothing else can give us in this kind of work. Technically, however, listen, these are not the only three called to ministry. It isn't just us on the platform or those of us out here in, in current ministry. Technically, listen, all of us are called by God. Do you realize that? Every single one of us has a call from God, first of all, from darkness to light. The Bible gives a whole list 
of callings we have. Well, let me just give you four. We are called from darkness to light. He invites us to come to him. He invites us to believe in him. He invites us to invest in him. He invites us to follow him. Every single one of us here has a calling from Christ. You're all called. Darkness to light, called to Christ. We are called to Christ's likeness or holiness, as the Bible repeats time and time again in various ways. We are called to witness and serve in his church. We are called to make disciples. So in a sense, every single one of us who consider ourselves open to God's work are called. All of us this afternoon, rehearse a little bit your sense of calling. Rehearse the fact that God has bothered to invite you to serve him in ways of effectiveness and fruitfulness. Keep in mind that not just these three, but all of us are called of God. Martin Luther, the leader of the Protestant Reformation, said at one point famously, vocation, listen, vocation is ministry. Not the other way around. Ministry is vocation. He said, vocation, whatever it is, is ministry. Whatever you are doing, do it all to his glory, and it is ministry. I remember hearing a story, a quaint little story years ago about in the Middle Ages, a couple of guys were helping. They were building a cathedral, and you had the stone cutters and the people doing all that, the skilled labor, and you had these two little guys shoving around a wheelbarrow, picking up trash and hauling it off. Somebody came up and asked one of these two men, so what are you doing? One of the two stood up and looked him in the eye, kind of threw his chest out and proudly said, I'm building a cathedral. It didn't make any difference to him what his job was, what his skill level was. All he knew is he was sharing in the responsibility. He was participating and carrying the load of building the cathedral. That's the kind of attitude it's worth having in this life for Christ. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 says he gives or assigns some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, all for the purpose of leading us to maturity, to the fullness of Christ. Calling, chapter 2, verse 17, is not my idea. It's God's invitation to make disciples. In chapter 1, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians, the apostle says, by the will of God, I'm doing this. In chapter 2, verse 17, he says, like men and women, sent by God. So in the tough times, in the complicated times, you've already had some of them, I'm sure. In the times that just aren't either fun to experience or invited or wanted, okay? In some of those times, remember your calling. This isn't just you. When the load seems overwhelming, be sustained and strengthened by realizing that you are sent and you're not alone in the process. And take a clue from the computer world, believe it or not. I'm not too good at that myself, except for this one. One of the ways to resolve a variety of computer glitches is to do what? Unplug and reboot. Sometimes the most important thing you can do is just unplug for a bit and reboot and watch things begin to work better. And above all, is the rest of the question. Who is equal? The rest of the question is to such a task. In sections of chapter 3, he talks about the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, will not the ministry of the Spirit of God be even more glorious if the ministry that condemns men is glorious? Listen, if the, if the ministry that condemns people is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? If the ministry of law was so good, how about the ministry of grace? He says this gospel we serve, this Christ we serve, is glorious stuff to represent. So you're called to an amazing kind of task, to such a task. So the first word, the first pillar is your calling. To sustain you, to help you, to strengthen you, to stabilize you. The second word is character. This calling demands noble character. 
This is the second pillar of that bridge. In chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we don't lose heart. Rather, we have renounced, listen, whether we have renounced secret and shameful ways, we do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everybody's conscience in the sight of God. Character. As leaders, we need to develop and display increasingly Christ-like character. I've oftentimes said, and I believe it with all my heart, there are a lot of people out there that are not in church today because of some of us who are in church. There are a lot of people who have turned away from Christianity per se because of a lot of folks who call themselves Christians, but just didn't come close to living the life. Discipline yourselves to become believable believers, winsome witnesses, credible Christians displaying Christ-like character. And as St. Paul said to Titus, I love this, in Titus chapter 2, verses, verse 10, he says, in every way possible, making the gospel of Christ attractive. Do you care at all about that? Do you care what people think about Christianity, what they think about the gospel of Jesus Christ? He says, in every way possible, don't just try to prove how right you are. He does not say, in every way possible, get involved in political arguments, he does not say any of that kind of stuff. He says, in every way possible, make the gospel of Christ attractive. Our calling is not to be right. Our calling is to be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. He's the one who helps us and helps them to find what's right. So we discipline ourselves that direction. When Jesus Christ was asked what the greatest commandment was, what did he say? Love. Love. What's the most important thing we can ever strive to do? From the law. What did Jesus say? Learn how to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Everything you've got. Pour yourself into loving God. And learn what it means to love your neighbor as, get this, yourself. You ever have trouble loving yourself? Sometimes I have trouble liking myself. But you can even get past what you don't like to learn how to love. Did you know that? Because liking and loving go opposite directions. So Jesus said, you can even learn to love the people you have a hard time liking. Most important thing we can do, he said. Ethical and moral failure is always lurking and available, waiting for an opportunity. Humility and depth of security are vital. A lot of us in this work are not terribly secure. <clears throat> I remember we started in Athens, Ohio, our first ministry assignment. And I remember a, a flashy old retired Presbyterian pastor, Fred Lukes. Fred would show up at the uh, ministerial gatherings every month, you know, and he had, had this big broad brim hat with a yellow and red ribbon hanging down from it. And he'd pass out literature telling about how he was one of the 10 best speakers in America. And I used to think, this guy is really, this guy's really a nutcase. You know, and, but he was, he was a likable nutcase. And, and when I asked about Fred's ministry in Athens, I found out that this, this dude had, was filling his church three times on Sunday morning every week. He was the going thing in town, his church was. And Fred would say, Holder, come over and see me sometime. And I thought, yeah, 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 I really need to come and see you. I got busy stuff to do. One day I felt a nudge of guilt and thought, why don't you go over to Fred's house? So I did. Okay, Fred, when? So I met with him, sat down at a picnic table in the backyard. He brought some iced tea out, as I recall. I thought, I'll impress him with a few good questions. So I said, Fred, look, I'm just new in this work. I'm in my early 20s. I said, tell me what I need to know. Fred Luke's rattled off three things. Number two and three, I totally forgot because of the first thing he said. He said, I used to take it personally when people would reject my ideas, when my, my counsel would tell me no. He said, whenever somebody disagreed with me, I would take it very personally as a source of personal rejection. He said, how wrong I was. 
He said, they weren't rejecting me. They just didn't like my idea. <laughs> That's all. So in the course of life and ministry and leadership, don't, don't feel personally rejected just because somebody disagrees with you. They simply don't like your ideas sometimes. It's okay. Fred Lukes was enormously helpful in my young ministry life during that time. First word is calling. It sustains you. It helps you. Character helps to make us win some witnesses. The third word under that, the pillar under the bridge is community. The power and value of community. One of the dominant New Testament themes in Christianity and ministry is that it is not a me thing, it's a we thing. I know we talk about personal salvation, personal Christianity, but I guarantee you, even Christianity is not just a personal thing. It's intended to be a we thing, not just a me thing. In 1 John, I had the privilege of writing a commentary for the church in 1 John. I was awestruck as I read the statement in 1 John that says that perfection and holiness is completed among us. It says love is perfected among us. It's impossible to be perfected in love all by yourself. You can only be perfected in love as you interact and relate to other people. Because love, like faith, is just not what you think. It's what you do to demonstrate what you say. And so community is vital. We need other people to help us grow in every one of the Christian virtues. Adam. I think God started off this pretty early, this partnership thing, didn't he? The community thing. Adam needed, what was her name? Eve. Moses needed Aaron. David was helped by Jonathan. Paul was deeply indebted to Timothy and many others. And every single letter of the Apostle Paul, he closes with a, with a little laundry list of the people who had been so important to him. Because the Apostle Paul caught it. Ministry is not a me thing. It's a we thing. We need a sense of community in what we're doing. COVID hurt us badly during that time because many people lost a sense of community. They were isolated, struggle with that isolation. Community. In every congregation, the growth and health of that church is affected by the quality and capability of its leadership, but also by the people who are a part of it. The current focus in churches everywhere is on classes and small groups based on our need for mutual support, challenge, and encouragement. There is hardly anything in life, those of you that have lost spouses, those of us that have lost a child to death, there's hardly anything in life that is more punishing than a sense of isolation and loneliness because we are made for partnership and community. Never forget the importance of having members of your community to help you. When I was in that early Athens church, I recall the importance of having two lay people that I chose to be able to share whatever was going on in my life and the ministry and to bounce questions off of them, to ask them what they thought about this, that, and the other. They were enormously helpful to just get the valued opinions of others in the course of what we were doing. Community. Ministry is not a me thing. It's a we thing. Congregations are enormously important in helping leaders lead well. Do you realize as parishioners how important you are in the success of your leaders? If nobody's following, we're not leading. And so it's a we thing in ministry, not a me thing. The fourth thing, the final pillar in this bridge to effective ministry is competence. Calling, character, community, and competence. Now this is a word that is seldom used among some of us evangelical holiness folks. I realize it sounds a bit worldly. But a lot of things in life require competence. Being a competent parent helps, doesn't it? Do you want to be an incompetent parent? Do you want to be an incompetent marriage partner? Do you want to be an incompetent Christian? 
Competence simply refers to capability, skill, giftedness, capacities we have developed or that God has given us. Just getting good at something. It'd be another sense of a set of amazing stories to hear. Just tell me, tell me what you think you are good. At. And we would hear in this room today some fascinating stories of how God has gifted some of us in a variety of ways, all over the map. And, and we realize that as we talk, talk about the, the various different things we are good at, hey, guess what? It kind of requires us all to get this thing done, doesn't it? That's why we have the concept in Scripture of the body of Christ. Because every part of the body counts competence. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul talks about training and running to win. The Apostle Paul talks about athletic contests nonstop. If you don't enter, you don't run. If you don't run, you can't win. There is an aspect of competence that's important in Scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he talks about the good fight, finishing the race, keeping the faith. At the core of the message of 1 John, back in your New Testament, we are born to win, is a part of John's message. It's made possible by the grace of God. St. Paul admonished us to do with all of our heart everything we do as unto the Lord. And 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-9 through nine, is a challenging and pointed statement of a series of how to keep getting better in the faith by adding to our faith the various elements of grace that cause us to become mature Christians. He says, so that... You will not be ineffective or unproductive in your knowledge of Christ. You hear, you hear confidence in that? Matter of fact, let me just uh, see a show. Of, how many of you would like to raise your hand and say, my, my goal in life is to be ineffective and unproductive? Well, I agree with you. I don't want to hold my hand up to that either. Because every single one of us, in some way, shape, or form, desire to have a sense of competence, to be effective in some ways, to be fruitful in some ways. The Bible calls us to live our lives that way. The Bible calls us to serve our churches that way. The Bible calls us to fulfill our callings that way as well. Now, when I graduated from Bible school, I was pondering going to seminary. It was, this was a rattling experience. And one respected pastor counseled me against going to seminary. He says, you could then spend three years going and, and reading all those books while people are dying and going to hell. Why would you do that? That was not fair. For one thing, that overhumanizes salvation. Salvation is not of me. And one thing I know is with the additional training I got, I spent 50 years, 52 years, being a more effective minister. In our gatherings of worship, we often have ignored excellence. Listen carefully. In our local churches, our gatherings for worship, we have often ignored excellence in what we do and how we go about it, the relevance of of what we're doing to those who check us out. One of our great challenges is reaching our communities for Christ. Uh, one of you mentioned in your comments, uh, um, Dennis, I think about reaching the community. And I would say that one of the things I learned in the last, listen, the last eight years of my ministry, I was retirement age before I finally learned the importance of leading your congregation to have meaningful connection with the community you're in. I was involved. I was elected president of school boards and prayed judges in office and prayed, uh, prayed bypasses open. I did all that. But I failed to be effective at leading my congregation in meaningful connection with its community. So my last eight years of pastoring, I made it a point of doing exactly that. And I discovered, I discovered that when a church demonstrates its value in a community, you will have a voice to your community. Do you hear that? Find every which way you can to have value to your community, and you will have a voice to your community. We have to do everything we can to make what I call worship that's worth it in our church lives. When seekers come to your place of worship, they're looking for substance. Are we doing it well? Is there appropriate depth and meaning to it? Does it connect with them how their lives are lived? Competence in everything we do. There are no prizes in any part of life or church for Christian, Christianity for incompetence. It just doesn't help. So get good at who you are in Christ. You okay with that? 
Just keep getting better at who you are in Jesus Christ. Keep growing. Keep learning. Keep asking God to help you overcome the things that need to be overcome and, and find the aspects of your life that you haven't discovered yet that help you serve him more effectively. For all of us, it doesn't make that much difference whether your idea is a better one than somebody else in church or not. The issue is, are you a healthy congregation that people can tell in a heartbeat when they come? This place is in love with the God they worship, and this place loves each other. I think I might stick around here. These are all powerfully important things <clears> that become a part of our ministry. So get as good as we can get. You guys behind me, too. Get as good as we can get. Then remember what Paul says in chapter 3, verses 4 through 6 about competence and Confidence, listen to what he says, chapter 3, such confidence. Who is able? The answer is nobody. To such a task, oh, now listen, such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God, not that, we, not, that, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from, guess who, God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills. The Spirit of God gives life. So who is equal? Alone? Nobody. However, our calling compels us and sustains us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is absolutely glorious. That's what we're called to. Our character is our witness, making the gospel of Christ attractive to others. Community is our support system. Partnership is vital. Ministry is about we, not me. And finally, competence arises from our preparation and God's anointing. So who is equal? Together, we are. May God help us to enjoy effective ministry in his name for his service and for the help of a lot of people who need what we have to offer. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Holdren, for those tremendous biblical words of encouragement and wisdom. And thank you for your pastor's heart. Andy, Dennis, this is a culmination of a tremendous, lengthy, and sometimes tiring journey. But it's only beginning. And Jeff, it's a new one for you. And God's still not done with you either. Gentlemen, would you please stand? Spouses, please remain seated. Pastor Doug, our district superintendent. I present to you as the chairman of the District Board of Ministerial Development, Dennis Holly and Andy Richmond, to be ordained as ministers, and Jeff Moore to transfer his ordination to the Wesleyan Church and then the Church Universal. Please remain stand. Thank you, Dan. Dear friends, these are they whom we purpose God willing this day to ordain ministers. For after due examination, we find that they are truly called to this function and ministry and that they are qualified for the same. reading from the epistle, <clears throat> Ephesians uh, chapters 3 and portion 4. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I'm less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this gift which for ages past was kept hidden in God created all things. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure 
of the fullness of Christ. From the Gospel of John, Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay, my life, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Gentlemen, would you indulge me one more time and please stand. Spouses remain seated. Dear servants of God, you have heard both in your private examination by the District Board of Ministerial Development and in the message which has been delivered to us today, something of the importance of the ministry to which you are now called. You are under shepherds of the Good Shepherd. The Lord Jesus called to teach and admonish, to feed and provide for the Lord's family, to bring the lost into the fold, to bring each person under the fullness of the stature of Christ. Remember always the greatness of this responsibility and give yourselves without reservation unto the ministry to which God has called you. We charge you to pray daily for divine guidance and strengthening so that by your study of the scriptures and your own personal growth and development, you may both model and ideal of Christ and lead your people to live in keeping with his example and instructions. Dr. Holdren, they have been charged. I invite you to examine. The assembled congregation out there actually represents the Church of Jesus Christ around the world. And as they witness your responses to the inquiries, the questions that shall make uh, you and your spouses um, a sense of responsibility, a sense of understanding helps us to understand your mind, your intentions, your will in these things. And we hope that these responses, your awareness will make you even greater in your faithfulness in doing the duties that God has laid before you. These are the questions. Is it your sincere conviction that you have been called by God to the office and work of a minister? And are you persuaded that you ought to fulfill that call by serving as an ordained minister uh, in the Wesleyan Church and among God's people everywhere? And if so, please say, that is my sincere conviction. Thank you. Do you believe the Holy Scriptures are the fully inspired and inerrant written Word of God containing sufficiently all doctrine necessary for eternal salvation through faith in Christ Jesus? And are you determined to instruct people from the Scriptures in order that they may be born again in Christ, become committed to holy living, be prepared to serve for the upbuilding of the Christian community in this present age? And if so, please say all of this I believe and accept as my duty. Don't make the answers too long here. Sorry, break them up. Do you uh, cordially accept our articles of religion and membership commitments? Do you agree to declare and defend them? And do you recognize your responsibility and cheerfully accept your obligation to promote and support the Wesleyan Church with its various institutions and ministries approved by the Wesleyan Church? And if so, please say, yes, I do. 
Will you with diligence minister the doctrines, sacraments, and disciplines of Christ, being always ready to challenge strange, unusual doctrines which are contrary to God's word, no matter where it arises? If you're willing to do that, please say, I will as God enables me. Thank you. Do you intend to make the reading of the Word of God uh, and effectual prayer your own earnest personal pursuits, and will you seek to make your lifestyle and your family relationships and witness exemplary as far as possible for you? And if so, please say, yes, the Lord being my helper. Yes, Lord being my helper. Believing that accountability and acceptance of authority is God's design for his church, will you cheerfully accept the direction of those whom God and the church may place over you in the doing of your work. And if so, please say, I will cheerfully do so. Do you hear that? That's good stuff. And to that I say amen, all right? At this time, if I could get your spouse to stand with you. And spouses, I would like to ask a couple questions to you. I can tell you that I know each one of you, and I know that most of your husbands would say that you are the rock that's behind them. I know that's what I say. And so <clears throat> it is the teaching of Scripture that a spouse shall be a loving companion in the ministry of a mate. You have witnessed the examination of your marriage partner and which, which commitment to work and responsibilities of ministry have been stated. Your participation in God's purposes for ministry through your marriage partner is important also. You will be needed to share in prayer, to extend love and compassion to all, to carry the example of marriage harmony and family wholesomeness. As a companion of your loved one who is now entering the ranks of ordained ministers in the church, Will you dedicate yourself to the compliment and embrace that ministry as God enables you? And if so, I will by God's grace. If you would please kneel at the altar, your spouses can kneel with you if they would like. The ordination committee gather around with us. We'll be laying on hands Andy first here. Andy Richmond, include Angie in this process. We lay hands on you today as a part of the Church of Jesus Christ. With this gathering of support to you, we ask that our Lord, our Heavenly Father, give you an outpouring of his Holy Spirit that is not just for the moment, but it's for your lifetime. Yes, yes. It's for your ministry and your work. Yes, because it's needed for your service as an ordained minister in his church. May God's anointing enable you to be a faithful and powerful exponent yes. of his word. Yes. To be an instrument for his holy sacraments. Yes. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Please take authority to preach the word of God, to administer the holy sacraments, to perform the duties of an ordained minister in his church, and may God bless you and help you as you do it. Amen. 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 Dennis Holly and Myra. We lay our hands on you today, representing the Church of Jesus Christ and ministry everywhere, asking our Heavenly Father, in the name of Christ, to give you an outpouring of his amazing Holy Spirit, not just for today, but for every single day of service. You are faithfully serving him and others, because you're going to need this in your service and ordained minister of the church. The obstacles are huge. The benefits are eternal. May God's anointing, sir, enable you to be a faithful powerful, effective exponent of his word. May he help you to be an instrument for his holy sacraments in the name of the Father, exponent of his word. And may this all be in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please, sir, 
take authority to preach the word of God, to yes. administer his sacraments, and to perform the duties, the many duties mm. of an ordained minister in his church. May God bless you as you do it. Amen. 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 Jeff Moore and Vanette, we join together as the ordaining committee today, ones who have taken this step before you, ones who have walked this path in front of you, and we pray that we might be examples in the process to you. As we lay our hands on you, we ask the Lord Jesus Christ to give an outpouring of his yes. spirit and his wisdom, yes. that it would be so powerful, so important for your work as an ordained minister in his yes. church. We pray that his anointing may enable you to be a faithful exponent of his word, to be an instrument of his holy yes. sacraments. And may this all be in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we pray today that you would take authority, take authority, Jeff, take authority to preach the word of God, to administer the amazing yes. holy sacraments, yes. and to perform the many, many duties of an ordained minister in his amazing church. And for this we give thanks in Christ's name. Amen. 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 remain kneeling if you would. The Lord said we should pray without ceasing, so that's what we're doing right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege to come before you today, and God, we just thank you for these servants who have stepped forward and said, here is my life, it is yours. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would so fill them, that God, that you would just use them in powerful ways, that Father, that... Um, that, God, that we know that, that we are supposed to love you with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our soul and all of our strength. And, God, I pray as they do that, that they would know your perfect love, but, Father, they would be known by your perfect love as well. So, God, I just pray that you would endue them with power of the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, that you would overcome the things that would seek to overcome them, and God, that you would use them in powerful and mighty ways in the context in which you have placed them. That you would be with them as spouse, as, as pastor. That God, that this is a team that you've joined together. And Father, until one of them lays the other into the loving arms of God, that you would just use them all the days of their lives. And they would never grow tired, never grow weary, never cease from the labors that you've given to them. Father, we just pray that your spirit would just come upon them in special and a precious way. God, that you would clothe them in your righteousness, and Lord, that you would just do beautiful things in and through them. It's in the loving name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep equip you with every good for doing doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom God to, to him be glory forever and ever amen at this time newly ordained ministers, we want to lead you from here to the cafeteria. And uh, we are going to go in procession and we will stand for the right hand of fellowship once we get into the dining hall. And we would invite all of you to go with us as we have a reception plan of celebrating what God is going to do in their lives. Dr. Dan, would you lead us? Thank you. 